Northern Ireland, certainly the western Northern Ireland, the highlands of Scotland, tomorrow will be a brighter day with some sunshine, just one or two showers. Elsewhere, a lot more cloud around on Wednesday, and there will be some outbreaks of rain that could be quite heavy, particularly over eastern parts of England through the course of Wednesday. A very soggy day here for some as we see that weather front pushing up, bringing warm air. So again, we could easily be in the teens. If we see some sunshine, 16 or 17, but for the west, brighter, not as warm, but we are looking at more sunny skies for the rest of this week. There'll be some showers across Scotland and Northern Ireland on Thursday. But once they're out of the way, lots of sunny spells and temperatures widely in the teens. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Good morning, it's 9.30 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and on your radio. Now this morning we turn to the cost of living. What will the Chancellor do to help in next week's budget? Should Boris scramble for Saudi Arabian oil? We will also turn to how Russia is influencing the English language internet, promoting narratives taken on by the far right and the far left. And we'll assess the new UK refugee policy as announced yesterday afternoon in the House of Commons. All that to come, but first, your morning headlines. Good morning, it's 9.31. I'm Rosie Wright. Let's get you up to date on GB News. Now, there have been large explosions in the centre of Ukraine's capital, Kyiv, as Russia's invasion of the country now enters its 20th day. Blocks of flats, residential buildings, they were heavily damaged during the bombardment overnight. Peace negotiations between Moscow and Kyiv resumed today after being paused yesterday. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky issued a video statement overnight and called for a fair peace between the two nations. Now, the Prime Ministers of Poland, the Czech Republic and Slovenia, they're going to meet President Zelensky in Ukraine's capital today. The leaders are going to present an EU aid package. The Czech Prime Minister said the visit will show the unequivocal support of the entire European Union for the sovereignty and the independence of Ukraine. A journalist is reported to have been arrested in Russia after interrupting a live news broadcast on a state television channel. Well, it's Channel One editor Marina Ostyanikova ran onto the set of the network's live nightly news show last night, shouting with a sign reading, don't believe propaganda, they're lying to you. President Zelensky has thanked her. 
I am grateful to those Russians who do not stop trying to convey the truth, to those who fight disinformation and tell the truth, real facts, to their friends and loved ones, and personally, to the woman who entered the studio of Channel One with a poster against the war. In some other news now, detectives investigating the murder of the journalist Lara McKee have arrested five men. The men aged between 20 and 54 were arrested in Londonderry this morning under the Terrorism Act. Ms McKee was murdered in April of 2019. You're up to date now on GB News. We're on your TV, online and your radio. Shortly, we'll head back to The Briefing with Tom. Good Tuesday morning, it's 9.33 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. Now, Chancellor Rishi Sunak will address the Commons in just over one week's time, setting out his spring statement, a fiscal event that's widely expected to contain measures to help with the cost of living. From subsidies to tax cuts, what could this involve? Well, I'm delighted to say that joining me now is Andrew Bridgen, Conservative MP for North West Leicestershire. Welcome to the programme, Andrew. Uh, first of all, there's considerable pressure from your colleagues to, uh, for the Chancellor to act on national insurance. Now, this wouldn't be a subsidy or a tax cut. It would simply be not going ahead with a planned tax rise. In your view, is this a tool in the bounds of possibility? Um, I think my hope is fading. I didn't vote for the national insurance increases when they were proposed. So one and a quarter percent extra on employers and employees. Uh, national insurance. From, in my view, this is a tax on jobs and a tax on employing people. Um, I think it's the wrong tax at the, at the wrong, wrong time. And when the, <clears throat> when the overall tax burden is the highest it's been since the Second World War, I think it's also highly inflationary. So all businesses will increase their costs and they'll have to put up all the prices of their goods and services. It's a concerning time, particularly as some reports are now suggesting that we're going to enter into the realm of double-digit inflation, potentially, by next year, as the Russia crisis compounds already the, the crisis we were seeing as we emerged from the pandemic and its associated lockdowns. I wonder, though, you said your, your hope was fading. Is this just because the, the institution of the Treasury is so cumbersome that this rise due to take place uh, just a couple of weeks after the spring statement, it might be too late for things to turn around? Yes, well, my experience um, of legislation and government is that um, when policies are announced, they're like meteorites heading to Earth. And if you can spot them a long way off and give them a tap, you can divert them away uh, and, and stop them impacting. But um, I'm afraid it looks as if this one's coming through the atmosphere and is going about to, uh, to hit us. And it's probably too late to change it now with all the preparations that have been made uh, to accommodate these national insurance increases. And, and one thing I'm really concerned about, Tom, is actually where this extra 12 or 14 billion pounds a year of taxpayers' money is, is supposed to go. It's going to go into the NHS for a few years to get rid of the NHS waiting list backlog, apparently, and then it's going to miraculously come back out and be put into social care. Well, in my experience, I've never known any money that went into the NHS or uh, ever come back out again or be available for redistribution. So I, I actually am fundamentally concerned about the policy overall. Certainly, it would be a very brave Chancellor who'd take £12 billion out of the NHS in order to put it into social care in a few years' time, as is the plan. I wonder, though, moving on from national insurance, what else might be in the Chancellor's toolbox? What might he be able to do to help ease that cost of living? Well, I mean, I think the government should take some very drastic steps. We're, we're effectively in a wartime e economy and uh, at times I think we're very close to, to actually being in a wartime situation given everything that's going on uh, in the Ukraine. Um, I think we need to get to drilling in the North Sea uh, for uh, exploiting our oil reserves. I think we need to get fracking. Um, we need to get on with the modular nuclear reactors as we are doing. And I think um, we need to stop the tax rises uh, coming in, cut the VAT on uh, on fuel and energy, and also the uh, the green tariffs 
as well to help out. This isn't going to be a short-term blip in the market and, um, and prices are going to return to normal with regard to uh, fuel and energy. Th this is long-term. Uh, as long as um, Vladimir Putin remains in the Kremlin, those um, restrictions on trade are going to uh, stay in place. Learning time for everyone. I suppose the, the, the vague hope of deficit reduction is taking second fiddle now to the prosperity uh, of individuals, at least in the short term. Um, well, thank you, uh, Andrew Bridgen, for talking through those issues there with us. We look forward and, and perhaps with trepidation to the Chancellor's statement next week. Thank you. Now, moving on, as the price of oil and gas continues to soar and the West weans itself off Russian energy, Prime Minister Boris Johnson is searching for alternate energy sources. Of course, we're expecting more nuclear power here in the UK, perhaps even our own natural gas. But these take time. And so the Prime Minister is seeking further dialogue with countries like Saudi Arabia, urging them to boost supply so we can avoid a 1970s-style oil crisis. Yet, as the West continues to cosy up to less than entirely irreproachable Middle Eastern nations, concerns rightly arise about human rights abuses. Who are we dealing with? Saudi Arabia beheaded 81 prisoners on Saturday alone on various charges, ranging from <coughs> terrorism to holding, quote, deviant beliefs. Are we at risk of simply swapping reliance on one despot for several more? Well, I'm delighted to say that joining me now in the studio is James Marlowe, a foreign affairs expert. Welcome to the programme. Um, first of all, we're expecting this grand diplomatic gesture, potentially even this week. The government reaching out to countries in the Middle East, trying to get them to spur on production. Are they likely to listen? Uh, yes, they are likely to listen, yes. But you mentioned the 1970s. I have to tell you, I'm old enough to remember those lights out to the early 1970s as well, petrol rationing and uh, us giving uh, just one minute to go ahead and find the candles, find the matches. A 1973 war, of course, mm. um, where OPEC, Saudi was the main player at that time, holding back oil to the West until Israel withdraw from certain Syrian territory. A uh, speed forward to 2022 today. Uh, the players have changed, but there's a very, very uh, similar circumstances. Of course, it's no longer Saudi in the picture, it's Russia in the picture. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to Saudi itself, I have to tell you, a lot of people around the world, a lot of companies, corporations, governments, they have no problem with dealing with China. Mm. They say, you know what? China is the one who, who we need the goods from. China is the one who produces much cheaper. And yet we see that over the last few years, their human rights record has not been fantastic. Mm. That's putting it mildly, of course. Um, one and a half million Uyghur Muslims, uh, at, at the very least, in detention camps. Mm. Uh, at the most, some of them being killed. Yet we still say we need those goods from China. We don't mm. raise an eyebrow. When Saudi comes into the picture, then people start to raise an eyebrow. And I'm certainly not a spokesperson on behalf of Saudi Arabia, I can mm. assure you that. But it's interesting to see where there is, um, uh, there, there is a, a, uh, a, it's the, the same players are involved. Mm. China is a human rights abuser, and mm. yet we're talking about, well, we mustn't take oil from Saudi. I wonder, though, in the context of where we are now, the reason we are experiencing some of this expected inflation in terms of oil and gas price, we're, we're wanting to punish a bad regime. We're wanting uh, Russia to stop behaving in the way it is, in the medieval way, in some ways, that it is, in this sort of uh, spheres of influence policy it's trying to pursue. Is there a worry that we're being slightly contradictive with ourselves there if we swap one despotic regime for one that literally beheads its prisoners? Yeah, absolutely. I think so. You know, just to step back, uh, global consumption is around 100 million barrels of oil a day. Mm. That's a, an incredible amount of, uh, of barrels of oil, although the price has gone down a little bit today, uh, but we're still in that very difficult territory. Mm. Uh, inflation is rising. Some people say by the time the summer comes, we'll be up to 10%, which is outrageous. Mm. Uh, but in terms of Russian output in their oil, uh, they kept out of the 10 million 
barrels a day. They kept six billion, sorry, they kept four million for themselves. They exported six billion. Of course, mm -hmm. the United States today is no longer taking that. Uh, we in Britain and the EU still relying on those, uh, those mm -hmm. barrels of oil. That means those governments have to find another six million barrels a day from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Venezuela and Iran is where Biden is looking from. And mm -hmm. I have to tell you, again, once again, you're dealing with regimes that have horrendous mm. human rights abuses against their own people. Mm. Iran, Biden is desperate now for another Iran deal in order to lift those sanctions completely. And I, I suppose there's a difference there between, at least with Saudi Arabia formally, the West is allied to it in terms of foreign policy. And that's exactly the point I'm trying to make, mm. exactly that. And I'd much rather do business with Saudi than Iran, mm. because one of the big problems with Oma Obama did, and I don't want to go off too much on a tangent, but one of the big problems is that this Iran deal, which was supposed to curve their nuclear weapon ambition, in mm. fact, I believe it's actually enhanced its nuclear weapon ambition, because they were still allowed, I'm talking about Iran, mm. they were still mm. allowed to spin the centrifuges. They were right. still uh, allowed to enrich uranium. They had no no uh, uh, cuts whatsoever on the international ballistic missiles. Mm -hmm. Now, international ballistic missiles uh, can already, from Iran, can already reach the Middle East, can already reach Israel and Saudi and the Gulf states, can already reach Eastern Europe. Those international ballistic missiles, which Iran is building, and by the way, this new deal still doesn't mention it at all mm -hmm. whatsoever. They're aimed for Paris, they're aimed for London, they're aimed for Berlin and possibly Washington, D.C. I, re I remember not so long ago, President George H.W. Bush, no, not H.W., <laughs> George W. Bush mm. talked about that axis of Senior. evil, mm. the, um, Junior, the, the axis of evil speech um, after 9-11, where he spoke about uh, Iraq and Iran and North Korea. And I, wonder, I wonder if we're having a new axis of evil now. Potentially, the risk is if we lean in to somewhere like Iran, they might be more allied with Russia than we realize. Before uh, Trump put sanctions on Iran, they were producing 200 um, uh, million barrels, excuse me, not 200, um, it was, I've got to look down at my figures over here, Iran was producing uh, 2 million barrels uh, of oil mm. per day. Mm. Uh, since the sanctions came in, it's one million barrels of oil a day. Now, wow. again, the West is hoping that Iran will push that up. Mm. I, I think we have to realize that one of the reasons why we got into this situation as well is also, it, the whole thing is linked in, pandemic. Uh, mm. There was a massive uh, 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 lowering of consumption yes. for oil all over the world, which we saw. All of a sudden, we suddenly need a lot more. Uh, those oil wells were shut down. Now we suddenly need this. That's why prices have gone up. Of course, the Russian war have not helped the situation no. as well. And just end up, because I can see in your eyes, we've got to wrap up over here, uh, to end up, I'd much rather do business with Saudi than with Iran. And if you want to say Iran, Saudi is a bad country, yes, it is. But look, mm. at, look at Venezuela, look at China, and look at the other countries as well Gosh. that we're dealing with. It seems like it's going to be a lesser of multiple evils option. I wouldn't envy the position of the Prime Minister this week or indeed over the last few weeks either. Well, thank you for coming into the studio and thank you for talking through all of those very uh, intricate issues uh, in the Middle East and beyond there. Um, of course, James Marlowe, Foreign Affairs expert. Now to a further aspect of Russia's war on the West. It's not just bombs and bullets hailing down on Ukraine, or as we saw in 2017, a chemical weapon deployed on the streets of Salisbury. No, Russia's warfare stretches to information too. But what are those KGB-style tactics being deployed against us here in Britain through online influence operations? And how can we avoid them? Well, joining me now is Richard Bingley, director of the Cyber Intelligence Forum. Welcome to the programme. Um, I saw a, a, an article you wrote this week about exactly how Russia intends to influence discussion, particularly on social media. They try and influence not just uh, the, the, the sort of far right uh, stereotype, but also far left websites in particular during this conflict. Could you speak to that? Yes, I mean, good. Good morning. I, I don't. I don't think they draw much of a distinction. That that the um, what what uh, CNN found and, and Clemson University back in 2020 was that um, Russian troll factories based in Africa were actually amplifying the message of the more extreme elements of Black Lives Matter, um, and the reason they were doing that and sort of helping the extreme elements of Black Lives Matter was to essentially sow the seeds of confrontation on the streets of 
American cities. So whereas the media have sort of focused a little bit, I think, on on sort of Russian influence of of right wing um, news agencies or social media, actually it's pretty indiscriminate. You know, the the, the the whole the whole sort of fringes are being essentially attacked by narratives that are being peddled by these sort of rogue regimes. And 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 as your last speaker said, effectively now a rogue. I'm afraid we're having a few issues with the line there. Let's try and persist for now. And I'll uh, just ask this one question. That's fine. We'll move on to our next guest for now. We'll see if we can get Richard Bingley back up later in the programme. I want to turn to a feisty exchange in the House of Commons yesterday. Michael Gove delivered a passionate defence of UK government refugee policy from the dispatch box. Let's take a look. Look. This country has taken in people from Syria, from Afghanistan. Yeah. We're taking in people from Ukraine. It is an uncapped scheme. Um, you know, we're, we're going to disagree politically and all the rest of it. But I've just had it up to here with people trying to suggest that this country is not generous. And all this stuff about hostile environment, the hostile environment was invented under a Labour Home Secretary. So can we just chuck it when it comes to the partisan nonsense and get on with delivery? A passionate performance there from Michael Gove. But does his rhetoric match the reality? And how will new homes for Ukrainians, that new policy, will it meet the moment? Well, joining me now is Labour MP and former Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, Peter Dowd. Uh, welcome to the programme. I, I suppose, first of all, it's been a remarkable civic response, at the very least, that we've seen yesterday. Since the Homes for Ukrainians website was launched, tens of thousands of British people have expressed their interest, signing up uh, to, to offer a space in their homes to Ukrainian refugees. That, I suppose, we should all welcome. I think we do. And I think the uh, British people are, in a sense, ahead of the government in this regard. And Michael Gove there, I think, was more passion than substance. I think he protested too much, so to speak. The government have been behind the curve. They've been behind political, broader political opinion. And they've been behind the opinion of the public more generally. And really, they have to, to use that phrase, up their game. And it seems to me that in saying uh, to local government and the no governmental organisations, the charities, etc., help us out by all means. But they've also got to have the tools to do that. There also has to be the process in place for those organisations to help. And that isn't quite there. And even saying to local authorities, oh, well, it's £10,500 per person, local authorities continue to be under huge financial pressure with services. So just offering money is not enough. You've got to have the government there backing organisations of having a system in place which is easy for you Ukrainian refugees to use. Now, can I just finish on this point? You still have this 50-page application. It's still a visa, it's still a visa system. You have to apply online. In God's name, where do these people going to be able to get their passports to prove their nationality? How are they going to get to online? These, these are in the most dreadful circumstances. And I think the government really do have to step up. That's interesting because, of course, it's not just the government who are proposing a visa scheme, but your party, the Labour Party, as well supporting a visa scheme, although uh, they describe it as an emergency visa scheme. It's still paper, uh, paperwork required. In, in your view, do both parties have it wrong here? Well, I think what we've got to do is to make it as simple as possible for those people in the most dreadful circumstances to get access to this country. Now, no one's pretending that we're the Poles we're, who have an actual border and, mm. and the rest of the Eastern European countries who actually have a border with, with uh, the Ukraine. We're not pretending that, but we do have to have a system where we take our fair share of these Ukrainian uh, refugees. So, for example, the European Union has a, has, a, has a system, basically, where you can you can come in, the procedures are being simplified, you can get status, you can get a, a residence there, you can get access to health care, social care, health care. They've made it as simple as they possibly can, mm. and that's really what we've got to do as a country. And I think that's what lots of people, and many people in this country, want. 
I suppose you could argue that that's exactly what the visa program delivers, although it might be complicated to get there. Once you have that visa, it's a three-year visa. It offers unlimited access to the NHS, to education. You're allowed to live, work, settle, and it's uncapped. It seems that uh, the fact of that visa is quite generous. The process to get that visa may be a little complicated, but I wonder if the way that we're going about this, unlike in previous waves of refugee crises, having British people offer their homes, having that be the first point of call, rather than lumbering local authorities with expensive hotel bills and the like, getting the British people involved at the first point of call in this way, Perhaps this is setting yes. out a new way in which we can go about refugee policy that actually has greater public consent. Yes, but the issue in that one is this, the devil is in the detail. Look, you can have as a, 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 as welcoming environment as you possibly can. So let's work on that premise. Let's say that we have a welcoming environment. And the figures you just pr produced about people offering their homes is an example of that one. But the process, the, the, the ability to get from A to B is the important thing. And now, I was listening to pretty grim stories in the House of Commons yesterday of people who were having dreadful, dreadful experiences in trying to get their family members from Ukraine to this country. People already living here trying to get their family members, old people, young people, people waiting in queues, but offices closing down for lunch hours that they can, so they can't actually get access to, to the office itself. I mean, it was awful, those experiences. You just look, have a look at the both debates in the House of Commons yesterday on this particular, the particular matter, and it would make your hair curl. It was just awful. So we've got to get the process right. We've got to get the mechanisms right. That's the key thing to this, because if we are welcoming them, we can be as welcoming as we want. But if we haven't got those processes in place, Mm. It counts for not as much as it should. I wonder what your view here is that this policy uh, proposal came from the housing department rather than the Home Office, that this is a competence now of Michael Gove, whereas uh, previously it was expected, well, up until the end of last week, really, that this would be a competence of Priti Patel and the Home Office. Um, what do you make of that distinction there, that move of competence? Well, I think that that speaks volumes because I think the p p position and the, the attitude that Priti Patel has taken throughout this has been dreadful. We've had lots of warm words from Priti Patel, but actually delivering has been difficult because her attitude, if you want, to emigres has been very, very hostile. And I think it was a, a hostage to fortune to put her in charge of because she would be challenged time after time after time about her record. And I think they've moved her off to Michael Gove to sort of uh, sanitise it a little bit, to be quite honest. And I don't mind that as long as it's delivered, as long as the process is there and it gets the people who need to be here, here. Yeah. Frankly, I don't care who's in charge of it. Mm. Michael Gove's as good as anybody else, I suspect. Well, that website launched yesterday. So far, tens of thousands of people have applied. Let's see how it rolls out and whether or not it will be as smooth as the government hopes over the coming weeks. Uh, but for now, Peter Dowd, former Chief, uh, Shadow Chief Secretary to the Treasury, uh, thank you for joining us here on The Briefing this morning. Now, that's it for me today. Coming up, it's To The Point with Patrick and Anaya. But first, here's the weather. Good morning. Definite signs of spring this week. A bit chilly out there again first thing this morning, but by this afternoon feeling fairly pleasant with some sunny spells. There's some fog around this morning also. That'll take a few hours to clear away. There are weather fronts surrounding the UK, but not many of them today providing much rain. This one is approaching the northwest, and we are going to see some soggy conditions and windy conditions too across the Western Isles, and that rain will trickle further across the highlands and into the west of Northern Ireland, but pretty not reach Belfast until this evening. The rain probably